Hey guys, my name is Joe and today we're going to be talking about column chromatography. Column chromatography is actually a couple different techniques that we're going to talk about now, but all of them have something in common and that is that you use column chromatography to extract a molecule that you want from a solution that has a lot of different molecules in it. So imagine you have a beaker and inside that beaker there's a solution of a lot of different molecules and you only want one or a couple of those molecules. You could use column chromatography to isolate the, just those one or a couple that you're looking for. So before we get started talking about the specific ways that we can do column chromatography that I've got written behind me, let's talk a little about what column chromatography actually is. So you'll have, as the name would imply, you'll have a column with a lot of resin in it. Resin you can imagine to be like little marbles almost, really tiny small marbles, usually made out of silicone or something else, that go and they fill up the entire length of the column. You take the solution that has all of the mixed molecules in it and you pour it into the top of this column. You'll pour it in and then something will come out the other end and that something's different for each of these which is why I'm being a little vague right now. But let's go ahead and get started and talk about the three types that we commonly work with in the lab. We've got ion exchange, size exclusion, and affinity. Ion exchange, the way it works is this resin that's inside of the column will be charged. It will have some sort of charge. It could be either positive or negative. Just to make things easier when we're talking, let's imagine that this resin is negative for this example. It can be negative or positive for ion exchange, but let's talk about when it's negative. So when it's negative, that means that positive molecules flowing through the column will bind to it. That means that that is called a cation exchanger. So a cation exchanger binds cations, which are positively charged molecules, which means that the resin would have to be negatively charged. Alternatively, you could have an anion exchanger that catches anions, which are negatively charged. So in that case, the resin would be positively charged. Uh, just to make things easy, though, we're just going to talk about cation exchangers for the rest of this example. So if we've got a cation exchanger and we've got the negative resin inside the column, what would elute first? That's basically the concept that we're going to try and hammer in for each of these types is what elutes first and what elutes last. Elute means to come out of the bottom. So if you have a cation exchanger, the cations get stuck to the negative resin inside the tube. So the cations don't come out very quickly. They come out last, actually. So now the resin is negative. So that means that it's going to repel other negative molecules. So that means that in a cation exchanger, the thing that elutes first would be the ones with the largest negative charge. Because you have a negative resin, so it pushes the negative molecules away from it and thus out of the column. Uh, that opposite would be true for an anion exchanger. So an anion would hold on to the anions and it would push the cations out first. Uh, but for this cation exchanger, the um, largest negative charge would elute first. So that means what elutes last? The, the thing that elutes last then would be the ones with the largest positive charge. They're going to move very slowly through the column because they're going to be attracted to all of this negatively charged resin going all the way down. That's pretty much the gist of uh, ion exchange chromatography. The next, the next big one is size exclusion chromatography. So the way this one works is the resin is no longer charged. For this one, the resin is neutral. But what it does have is I'm going to draw it enlarged here just so that you guys can see the resin's not actually that big but the resin will have this sort of maze going through it. That's how you can think about it. It has this path and each of them will have this. So basically the resin makes a really long convoluted path. So what happens now when you pour in 
your solution from the top. The small molecules that fit inside of this path, let me grab a different color here, the small molecules that fit inside of this maze will follow it down. The big molecules that don't fit in this path, they're just going to go around the resin and come out the bottom. So the key here is that you have to realize that both the big molecules and the small molecules have the same velocity. All the molecules have the same velocity. Since they both have the same velocity, the one that has to travel the longest distance, aka the small one that has to travel the convoluted path through all of the uh, maze-like resin, the smallest one is going to take the longest time to get out because they're going the same speed, but it has a much farther distance to go. So that means that what elutes first here? The thing that would elute first would be the biggest molecules because it won't fit inside of this path, so it's just going to bypass it and go right to the bottom. So the one that elutes first are the biggest. By biggest, we mean biggest in size, but for the purpose of just about any exam type setting, you can assume that biggest size means biggest molecular weight. Now that's not entirely true in the theoretical sense of chemistry, but for this purpose you can assume that the biggest means the biggest molecular weight. Uh, that should get all of your questions right for you. So then what elutes last? The thing that elutes last would be the smallest molecules because they have to take this really long convoluted path, so it takes them a while to get out the other end. Uh, finally, the last thing we have is affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography is the most exact and the most expensive of the three that we've got here today. The way it works is that the resin will have, once again, I'm going to blow it up just so you can see it, the resin is going to have covalently bound ligands to it. Here by ligands, we just mean something that very specifically binds to a molecule. Uh, think antibodies. Antibodies bind very, very specifically to one molecule. And so that's what you would want in your affinity column. You would take the ligand, uh, I'm sorry, you take the resin and you would, bound, you would bind to a ligand that very selectively binds only to the molecule that you want, like antibodies. So now you take, you take the solution and you pour it into the top and everything elutes out of the bottom except for the molecule that you want. Because the molecule that you want is going to be attached to the ligand which is attached to the resin. So now what elutes first in affinity chromatography? The thing that elutes first is all of the garbage. Everything that comes out in affinity chromatography is stuff that you are not looking for, stuff that you're just going to throw away. And the reason for that is because the stuff that you do want is still bound to the ligand. So now, how do we get the stuff that we want out? If it's stuck to this ligand, it's not going to do us any good inside the column. Uh, we want to pull it out. And the way we do that, there's actually a couple different ways uh, that we can make the one we want elute. So to make ours come out, ours is in the molecule that we're looking for, we can do two things. First, we can add in salt. When we add in a lot of sodium chloride, uh, it will cause those the interactions between the ligand and the molecule to be weakened and the molecule that we want will just, uh, the bonds will be broken between the ligand and it'll just come out. The other option that we could do is we could add free ligand. If What I mean by free ligand is we could take a solution. Uh, so imagine we have a beaker that has a solution in it, and in that solution, we could put the same ligand, the same molecule that binds very specifically to our molecule, but it's not going to be attached to resin. It's just going to be floating around inside of uh, whatever solution I've got, inside of water or whatever it may be. 
So then when I pour the, this solution into the top, this free ligand is going to travel. Let me get a third color for you guys. This free ligand is going to travel through the column, and it's going to attract all of the molecule that we want, and it's going to pull it away from the resin. So we've got this ligand, and it is basically, this ligand is basically stealing the molecules that we're looking for from the rest of uh, the resin-bound ligand. So now, if we do that, coming out of the bottom of the column, we'll have a solution that has ligand in it bound to our uh, molecule, and then we can do some further chemistry to separate that, but that's not uh, the point of column chromatography, that's just other chemistry. So these are the three different types of column chromatography that are commonly used. I hope this made it clear. If you guys have any questions, feel free to comment, and I'll definitely get back to you. Have a good one.